Good day, everyone, and welcome to the webinar for the 2023 Macy Faculty Scholars Program. I am Peter Goodwin, Chief Operating Officer and Treasurer at the Josiah Macy Jr. Foundation. The purpose of this webinar is to provide you an opportunity to hear from the principals involved with the Macy Faculty Scholars Program. Today, we will share with you the vision, the highlights, and information about the program, as well as the application and selection process. Our agenda today will be in two parts. First, we will provide a brief presentation that will then be followed by a question and answer period. At the end of the Q&A, we'll spend a few final minutes on some details that you will need to know in order to submit your online application to the program. This webinar is being recorded. You'll be able to view the slides and listen to the presentation and the Q&A portion of the webinar on our website within the next week. For any questions you have during today's presentation, please use the Q&A function on your Zoom screen. We will answer as many questions as we can at the end of the prepared remarks. And now I'm pleased to introduce to you our presenter, Dr. Holly Humphrey, president of the Josiah Macy Jr. Foundation. Holly? Thank you, Peter. And I'm really um, thrilled to have an opportunity today to introduce you to the next generation of the Macy Faculty Scholars Program. And um, I'm going to say a few words about exactly what I mean um, by referring to this program as the next generation. And I want to begin by emphasizing that the vision um, for this program remains unchanged. And you see the highlights of that vision on um, the screen in front of you. We have a continuing commitment to nurture the careers of future leaders in nursing and medical education. We are looking for early career faculty. And when I use those words, early career, it often creates question um, about what do I really mean by that? And we don't have a hard and fast, uh, precise um, definition, but to give you an idea, I would say, faculty members who are in their initial three to eight years of, of appointment, um, we noticed over um, recent years that we were receiving applications from more and more senior faculty. And so we're just trying to pivot more closely to the um, earlier career faculty members, someone in their third to eighth year as a faculty member. But again, that is not a hard and fast um, set of parameters. The vision of this program, as in the past, is to provide protected time in order to really create the kind of educational um, program, project, and scholarship that really um, boosts the career development um, for a faculty member, and importantly, results in innovation and change at um, your local institution in a way that um, perhaps has the opportunity to disseminate um, nationally and globally. Um, we do want scholars who are um, in a position to create educational change at the institutional level. And um, ultimately we're looking to help promote, support and develop the careers of what becomes a national cohort of leaders and innovators. So I know that sounds um, like an ambitious and bold uh, agenda, and it is, um, but that is the vision uh, that guides the program. And so as I speak about um, the next generation of the program, um, I want to just provide a little bit of background. And that background is that in 2019, as the Macy Foundation um, neared the first decade of experience with the Macy Faculty Scholars Program, we invited an external group of, of reviewers um, to assess the program. Um, what 
could we learn from that first decade of investment? And what um, came about as a result of that review um, was a set of recommendations, which um, we at the Macy Foundation reviewed, considered carefully, and along with our board of directors, um, the National Advisory Committee and the alumni scholars of this program, um, we are prepared to implement those um, recommendations, one of which I've already mentioned and which you see on the screen um, in front of you. And that is, um, we are eager to support a cohort that is more junior in their faculty appointments. Um, we have a, a special interest in trying to um, reach broader areas of this country by um, looking for and actively um, uh, cultivating a more diverse applicant pool um, and a more diverse um, ultimate selection of our scholars that come from more diverse institutions. We have just a, a wide variety of nursing and medical schools in this country. Um, we are looking for a broad geographic um, diversity of applications, of types of populations of patients who are served um, by those institutions. We're aiming to um, stimulate applications from community-based and research institutions. So our definition of um, this broader outreach is in itself um, a broad definition as we seek to um, reach parts of the country and people and populations who we have not um, necessarily historically reached. Now, um, I want to talk a bit about the highlights of this program, which you'll see on this slide. And um, as has been um, the case in the past, this is a career development award. And that's how we hope you'll think about the program. It's a career development award that provides 50% protected time in order to pursue this mentored project at your home institution. In addition to that, um, you will receive mentoring from a member of our National Advisory Committee and a member of the Macy Faculty Scholars um, Alumni Group. You also will be um, supported to participate in uh, coursework through the Harvard Macy Institute, um, which has a, a wide variety of programming. You will be um, a participant in an annual meeting of our Macy faculty scholars and our scholar alumni. And you will have access um, to other uh, Macy grantees and other Macy uh, programs. So that is a high level overview of the highlights of the program. So let me um, turn to say a few words about the eligibility criteria. Um, the eligibility criteria are, um, we hope, uh, straightforward, but I expect there may be questions and we um, have saved time, as you've already heard um, in this webinar, in order to address those questions. So um, the applicant must be a faculty member who's doctorally prepared at a school of medicine or nursing. I've already mentioned um, the place in the faculty um, ranking system of um, applications that we're particularly interested in receiving, specifically an earlier career uh, faculty member. The individual must be nominated by the dean of the nursing or medical school. And importantly, each school can nominate only one individual. And so sometimes at many schools, this results in an internal um, competition so that the school can determine um, which faculty member to put forward as a nominee. Um, the nominee must also have identified a local faculty mentor. Um, and that mentor um, actually will be one of the individuals who writes a letter of support. And I'll um, say more about the components of the application in a moment. Um, and the candidate and the mentor must comment on um, the educational project that addresses at least one of the Macy Foundation priority areas. And um, our priority areas are articulated in some detail on our website. Um, I'll just say at, at a high level, 
they are priorities that focus on the clinical learning environment um, where young doctors and young nurses um, work and learn. And in the clinical learning environment, we have three major funding priority areas on diversity, equity, and belonging in the clinical learning environment, on collaborative, high-performing teams in that same environment, and on navigating the ethical dilemmas that arise in that environment. So um, the project does not need to focus on all three of those areas, um, but at least on one of those priority areas. And then um, finally, the applicant must be a US citizen or a permanent resident of the country. So let me um, say in more detail a word about the application itself. So the application itself um, will consist of a statement of the applicant's career objectives and goals. And I would say of all of the components of the application, this turns out to be one of the most important. So we really want to have a sense of who you are, what your aspirations and dreams are of um, your, your role as a clinician educator for the next generation of nurses or physicians. We of course um, need a description of the project um, that you're seeking to implement. We need a letter of nomination from the Dean and one from the mentor, as I've already mentioned. We also need a letter of support from your department chair. And one of the important features of the letter from your department chair is a commitment to um, provide that 50% protected time free from other clinical duties or responsibilities that you might have in your faculty role, because that's in fact what the Macy Foundation is paying for. And that's in fact um, why this is considered a career development award. In addition, we'd like to see letters from one or two additional senior faculty members who know you well and who know um, about not only your project, but importantly about your career potential and your career aspirations. And then finally, um, we need a CV um, from the applicant and a CV from the mentor. We do not need CVs from any of the other uh, letter writers um, the dean or the department chair, but from the applicant and the mentor. Now, um, once we receive the application, let me say a word about how our committee um, reads those applications and ultimately um, the criteria that we use to make the ultimate selection. So we are looking for evidence of a strong career commitment to education. And that's why that personal uh, statement about your career objectives is so important. Where are you today and where do you aim to be in the future? We also want to get a sense of your promise as an educator and as a leader. We like to see evidence of um, innovation and creativity um, in your career. We're looking for evidence of scholarship in education. Have you um, demonstrated um, a track record of turning any of your educational programs or educational work into scholarly work? And then we um, consider the merit of your educational innovation project. Um, what's the likelihood that this is really um, achievable and possible? Um, what's the likelihood of success uh, for the project that you're proposing? Um, we're looking for evidence of strong institutional support. And we do that through the letter from your department chair and from your dean. And, and then ultimately we try to make an assessment of your potential to become a leader in health professions education. I would, would like to now drill down to um, the specifics of the selection process itself. So um, once the application um, is submitted, senior Macy staff will review all completed applications. And after we have reviewed the entirety of the applicant pool, we will select a group of semifinalists. And that group of semifinalists will be shared with our national advisory committee, who will then review the semifinalist applicant pool to select a group of finalists. And in general, 
we aim to select approximately 10 finalists. Um, those individuals who are selected as finalists will have an interview um, by the National Advisory Committee and senior Macy Foundation staff. The scholars who are ultimately selected will be notified by the end of February. Um, I'm making, I'm putting a stake in the ground here and saying um, that you will be notified by February 23rd, 2023. And the appointment will begin on July 1st of 2023. Um, for those of you who have been following this program in prior years, you may recognize that this is a different timeline that, than we have used in the past. And we have been very intentional in creating this timeline to better align with the planning for the academic year in schools of nursing and medicine so that um, you know well in advance before the um, assignments for clinical responsibility and teaching assignments for the next academic year begin. And so that's why we're making the decision um, by the end of February um, and the year of funding actually begins in July. So on the next slide, you will see the key dates. Um, and these key dates obviously are very important. Um, so the applications will close at 3 p.m. Eastern time on August 1st, 2022. So you have the summer um, to go through the process in terms of the nomination from your local institution and um, the final submission of the application. Um, you will be notified of your application um, status by January 3rd, 2023. The finalist interviews um, for those approximately 10 people who are chosen as finalists will take place between February 21st and 22nd of 2023. We like to tell you that date right up front um, so that there will be no conflict um, should you be selected as a finalist there would be no conflict in you being able to participate um, in the finalist interview. And then as I've already mentioned, the actual appointment begins on July 1st. Those um, key dates um, will be important obviously for you to not only be aware of, um, but to adhere to. And uh, we look forward um, to receiving applications for many of you who are watching and uh, participating in today's webinar. And now I'd like to turn it back to my colleague, uh, Peter Goodwin. Thank you, Holly. Um, as a reminder to all of you who have attended this webinar, you can use the Q&A function uh, in your Zoom screen to, um, to ask a question uh, that we will review and, and answer orally. There are a number of questions that are coming in through the Q&A functions. So thank you all for your interest. Um, Holly, I'll start with this one, which has to do with um, eligibility. Um, if someone is on faculty for two years as a full, in full-time service, but has also been a postdoc fellow at that institution for two years, are they eligible to apply under the criteria? Yes, absolutely. You would be eligible um, to apply. And I would just invite you to um, consider several of the elements that I mentioned as part of the application in terms of, have you had enough time to really demonstrate um, the conversion of your educational and clinical work to scholarship? In other words, do you have a track record of scholarship? Secondly, are you in a position at your local institution to affect um, change with a program or a project that you're in, interested in developing? And I know that many of you in your very early years, one your first or second year on the faculty are in fact in a position as a course director or a clerkship director. Um, and so absolutely you may be well positioned. On the other hand, if you're just getting started and do not yet have a track record of scholarly work or are not yet in a position to affect real change, then perhaps um, you know, it's less important how many years you've been on the faculty and more important 
um, what your overall comprehensive application um, might look like. Thank you, Holly. We have um, several questions um, from folks who are non-MD and non-RN. Um, and they are asking for, for example, if a school of nursing includes faculty from other disciplines or a school of medicine for that matter, can those who are non-nurses or non-MDs apply if they are still faculty in that school, whether it be a school of nursing or a school of medicine? Yes, you may still apply. And um, the most important issue for you to know right up front, if you are neither a nurse or a physician, is that you will need to be nominated by your institution's school of nursing or school of medicine. We do have examples of Macy faculty scholar alumni um, who are not nurses or doctors, but they were the nominee from either their school of nursing or their school of medicine because um, they met all of the criteria in terms of uh, a project that was innovative and going to impact the education for the next generation of doctors or nurses. Um, they had the support of the institution. They had a scholarly track record. They were doing the work um, that directly impacted the next generation. So um, yes, you may apply, but you must have the ultimate nomination from your professional school of nursing or medicine, and it's been done before. Holly, this next question um, is about the scholar applicant's mentor. Um, does the mentor um, have to be from the institution that the scholar resides at, or can the mentor be from a different institution? Yes, great question. Um, we do have examples of the mentor being at a different institution. And when that has happened, it has been because the project needed a specific um, area of expertise that um, was not present at the institution where the individual um, resided, or it was present in a way that um, would not be of benefit to the uh, to the applicant or to the project in the way that a mentor from outside the institution um, might be able to serve. So if you're in a situation with a project that you know there is a spectacular mentor um, in an institution that is not your own, by all means, um, pursue that, but you must have the support of your own institution. And that's why we need the letter of support from your department chair um, and from your dean um, to say that, that they support this idea of yours, um, that they support um, the overall presentation of your project with a mentor that is uh, someone who is supplementing the guidance and mentorship at your local institution. And very importantly, that they're not only going to support your idea and this external mentor as well, but they're going to give you the protected time that you need in order to um, participate in all of the aspects of the program that I described. Let's stay on this, um, stay in the same vein. Um, regarding the senior faculty letters of support, those additional letters of support that you mentioned in your presentation, do they have to be from someone who is at the applicant's institution or could they also be from someone who resides at another institution? Yes, another great question. Um, the most important characteristic of those two letters is that they're written by individuals who really know you. They know your track record. They know your goals and aspirations. They know how you get your work done. They know um, your ability to deliver on a promise. They know your ability to turn around your work. They know your effectiveness with um, students or residents or graduate students. They know your interactions with your colleagues. So individuals who can speak about you as a person and the many different um, aspects of your, your work is the single most important factor. And if you are getting letters perhaps from people who you worked with at an earlier stage in your career 
or who you have worked with for a long, long period of time in your career, that's entirely appropriate. But you must be able to demonstrate support from your own institution through the letters of support from your department chair and from your dean. So um, I hope that's clear that you're welcome to get letters from an external, a person external to your institution for all the reasons that I said, but um, it has to be accompanied by and supplemented by those other letters so that we know that you have the support of your institution as well. We'll continue with the mentor questions because we're getting a number of them, Holly. Um, could the um, scholar applicant's mentor be the department chair or even the dean of the school? Yeah, great question. I will say that over the years, um, we do see several department chairs and deans who do serve um, as mentors, but I would um, submit to you that um, that can be a mixed, um, there can be a mixed interpretation of a department chair or a dean as a direct mentor. And the reason that there can be a mixed interpretation is quite simply um, the time that those individuals who occupy those kinds of roles and in institutions, the time that they would have to devote to the mentorship of an individual. Um, project. And in general, our committee has, has tended to believe that individuals in those positions do not have adequate time um, to mentor a project. Now, there are some exceptions. Um, uh, probably the, the cleanest example of an exception is um, there is someone with whom you as an applicant have worked earlier in your career either as a graduate student or as a, a fellow um, or in some other capacity, and you have a track record of working with that individual. And it's possible that over the course of time, that individual has risen to one of these positions as a department chair or as a dean, but the kind of work that you're doing and that they uh, supervised you in um, continues. And then it, it's a much more natural kind of um, relationship and um, the rationale for that individual being your mentor makes a lot of sense. However, if this is a newer relationship and the mentor is a department chair and a dean who's, who's just really well connected, um, and sometimes that is attractive um, as a potential mentor, the committee tends to be a little bit more cautious about that relationship for the reason of uh, time allocation that they would have available to you. The um, one other thing that I'll mention is that sometimes depending upon the project and the specifics of the project that you're proposing, it turns out that the department chair or the dean is a national expert in that area. Um, whether that's a patient safety and quality issue or um, a diversity, equity, and inclusion issue. Um, it could be any number of issues. And then sometimes that natural alliance, again, will make sense. So I hope that gives you some sense that um, it can be um, very legitimate for you to have a department chair or a dean as the mentor to you and for the specifics of your project. But I would caution you to be very, very careful about making that choice for um, the many reasons that I mentioned. So let's move to another area, which has to do with the educational project that the applicant would be proposing um, and would be funded if they were approved. You mentioned earlier, Holly, the foundation's interest in receiving applications related to its three strategic priority areas. Could you expand for a few minutes on the area of diversity, equity, and belonging as a proposed innovative educational project for the program? Yeah, I'm, I'm very glad that you asked about that um, because we um, do see confusion um, in, in that priority area because it is so big, 
so important. Um, and there's so much work to do that it's not uncommon for the Macy Foundation to receive grant applications, for example, um, that are focused specifically on addressing disparities in patient care. But there is no evidence in those applications that there are teachers and learners involved in trying to address that disparity. So while, of course, we are strongly supportive of doing everything that we can to reduce disparities in patient care, we at the Macy Foundation are specifically looking for the educational project that involves students and those those students, I'm using the word students, I should probably be using the word learners because the, the learners can come in any um, variety. They can come as students, they can come uh, in the form of residents in, in residency or in fellowship programs. They can come in the form of graduate nursing students, but there must be a student and a teacher or a learner and a, a faculty member engagement in um, their work and in their interactions together that would put forward a project that speaks to the diversity, equity, and creating belonging in the clinical learning environment. And there are so many opportunities um, where that kind of a project um, would be very um, relevant. As long as you stay focused on learners and teachers, and then you can go in any direction you wish to go with respect to diversity, equity, and belonging, but the educational piece has to be front and center. This next question, Holly, um, also relates to the proposed educational innovative project. Um, could you uh, speak to how much detail that the foundation is looking for in the description of the project? Yes, that's, um, that's a very good question. And I would suggest that um, the kind of presentation of your project should follow a scholarly format. And what I mean by that is the best projects uh, begin with a theoretical framework. So you have a theoretical um, framework that you are going to use for the issue that you're addressing. So um, when I say they begin with that, they actually begin with the question that you want to ask, the um, problem statement that you're trying to um, articulate and address. And once you have that problem statement um, or the question that you're trying to address, then we're really looking for a theoretical framework that might be applicable to helping us better understand and then ultimately implement a project. Then um, we're looking for the, the standard format that you might use. What are the methods um, that you're going to use to um, explore the topic, to teach about the topic, to implement um, your innovative idea? And then very importantly, how are you going to assess? Um, the project? How are you going to evaluate that project? How are you going to know that your project made any difference at all in that problem statement or question um, that you outline? And then um, I always encourage um, a robust project to have some kind of a dissemination plan. How are you going to share the news um, with other educators and with other institutions? Um, your project um, may have encountered uh, obstacles that you weren't um, expecting. Or um, there may be some very interesting, innovative, and easy ways for other institutions to implement exactly what you implemented. And so how are you going to disseminate um, the work of the project that you have underway? So that is the kind of detail that we're looking for in terms of a structured uh, presentation. Um, we don't want, um, you know, enormous detail, but we do want structure. We want evidence that you have um, searched the literature. You don't need to, um, you know, send us 200 references by any means, but we need to have confidence 
that you have investigated and explored this topic that led you um, to be in a position to propose the topic to us? Thank you, Holly. Um, this next question also stays on the, the educational innovation project that's being proposed. Um, earlier, you talked about the diversity, equity, and belonging priority. But if an applicant is going considering targeting multiple NACI priority areas in their project, would that be favored over an application that just targets one of the priority areas? Yes, that is, um, that's a, a wonderful question because um, it is, I think, often the case that when you have um, an idea that can touch all three of those areas, um, it gets extra points. And we don't have a point system. Uh, we don't use a point system, but the very best ideas often will intersect in all three of those areas. The most important thing is that you have real clarity around what your project is. Sometimes we see ideas that are so big and so broad, kind of at the 32,000 foot level, um, in an effort to touch all three priority areas, that there's just no way you would be able to implement a project in a two-year time frame. So, the most important element is the project itself, that there is clarity around what that project is, what you're aiming to do in the two-year time frame, and then perhaps um, in that two-year time frame, you're you're piloting a project that would lead to a bigger project down the road, but don't force it to fit in all three areas if it doesn't naturally fit. On the other hand, if it does naturally fit, um, go for it. Um, but, but please don't feel as if you need to um, focus in more than one of our priority areas. This next question is about um, non-salary support. Um, could you clarify what non-salary support is available and what kind of budget needs to be submitted? And I'm happy to answer this question, Holly, if I, if I may step in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. I was going to turn to you, Peter, oh, so great. take it away. So um, as Holly mentioned earlier, the, the award is provides for 50% protected time um, each year of the two-year award um, that is capped at $100,000. So it's $100,000 for protected time, which we expect to be 50%. In addition, um, the foundation also provides $25,000 each year for project support for your educational innovative project support and for professional development that you may use um, to attend conferences, coaching and the like. And so the total maximum award would be $250,000. In addition, the foundation provides support directly to the Harvard Macy Institute and allows you to attend at least one course that we will pay for directly um, as well as access to mentors on the National Advisory Committee and to the, um, the scholars alum community. So that represents the, um, the non-salary um, uh, non support, if you will. Holly, the next question is about the applicant's track record of scholarship. Do you consider scholarship outside of peer-reviewed publications or are the peer-reviewed publications really what you're looking for as a track record of scholarship? Uh, I personally relate to this question, having uh, spent my career as a, a medical educator, and that is um, a, a strong commitment to scholarship in the broadest possible terms some of which is peer reviewed, but of course not all of which is peer reviewed. So it's entirely appropriate um, to apply with a track record that has a broad definition of applied scholarship. However, the one caution is that the applicant pool itself has historically been so competitive that um, you're often competing against individuals who have a track record of scholarship in the broadest sense, including significant peer-reviewed publications. 
So while that's not an absolute requirement by any means, I think it could be hard to compete um, in the applicant pool without peer-reviewed applications. I hope I hope that's helpful to you as you think about this. So um, non-peer-reviewed non-peer-reviewed parts of your application are welcome and deeply appreciated, but I think it'll be hard to compete at a national level without at least some peer-reviewed application, uh, peer-reviewed products. Holly, there's a number of questions that are trying to, I guess, better understand the notion of early career faculty. And you talked about that in your remarks and you mentioned we were looking at an approximately three to eight years as sort of a, um, a soft, uh, soft boundaries, if you will, around that. Um, but we're getting a number of questions from people who are asking if I'm mid-career, am I eligible? If I'm a professor at the professor level, am I eligible? Um, so I think there's folks are trying to understand a little bit more. Can you, can you spend a little more time talking about that? Yes. Um, one of the reasons that you are likely um, feeling as if there's a lack of clarity there is that in fact there is, and that's intentional on our part in, in large measure because institutions have some commonality related to their appointment and promotion process, but they also are very different from one another. And um, people advance at various rates using various criteria and that's why it's hard for us to say, you must be um, an associate professor because it's not necessarily a, a level playing field across the entire country. So what we're trying to do is bring um, some applications to the Macy Foundation that represent faculty who are more junior in their career than what we have been seeing over the last several years. And of course, you don't know what we've be, been seeing, but let me try to be very specific about what we have seen in the applicant pool um, for this program. And uh, it's fair to say that in the last several years, we have increasingly seen applications from schools of medicine and nursing with faculty members who are very, very senior in their career. And the way I'll define that for today's conversation is we're seeing individuals who are in the final phase of their career. They often are not only at the professor rank, but they often have tenure and a named professorship. Um, so those elements of the seniority of the faculty um, applicant is not consistent with the kind of faculty applicant we're looking for. So when I then pivot to tell you we're looking for an earlier faculty um, member, and I'm saying in general, let's say three to eight years on the faculty, those are not hard and fast rules by any means, um, because some of you I know have perhaps worked in a part-time capacity, um, raising children for eight, nine, or 10 years. And now you're just joining the faculty as a, a, as a full-time faculty member. And so in some ways your clock is, is starting over. So you might be in your 13th year, but you have um, spent the early part of your career um, not working in a full-time capacity or perhaps working in a full-time capacity, but simultaneously juggling family responsibilities and all the things that you juggle in those early years. So when, that's why I, I hesitate to give you an exact cutoff um, for a number of years. And that's exactly why I'm not going to do that. While I say three to eight years, it's to give you a range, but I know that each of you have individual circumstances. Um, that have impacted your career and your life. And if you think, and if your institution thinks that you are on an upward trajectory early enough in your career and you're in a position to affect real change in your institution, it really doesn't matter 
um, to me, whether that's been, you know, one year or 13 years or 14 years. But what I'm really looking to not see is somebody who is really in a position to be the mentor for other individuals for their own scholarly project. So we're not looking for that very senior tenured faculty member who mentors the next generation. We're looking for the more junior individual, clearly mid-career individual, but who has not yet achieved the academic um, success of the, of the more senior mentor. Let's uh, return to the eligibility question. Um, are non-physicians eligible? For example, um, an assistant professor in pharmacy or biomedical informatics, could they apply to the program? Yes, uh, if you have a terminal degree, uh, the advanced degree in your discipline and you are being recommended, nominated by the School of Medicine or the School of Nursing, and your project includes teaching the next generation of nurses or doctors or both, um, then you would be considered eligible. Holly, um, there's an applicant here who, or a potential applicant here who's interested if whether or not the foundation provides feedback to applications that are not selected. Um, and also, as part of that is, how common is it for someone to apply uh, multiple times to the program? Thank you for that question, uh, for both of those questions, because um, several years ago, I was a dean for medical education who year after year nominated uh, faculty members for the Macy Faculty Scholars Program, and year after year, my nominee was not selected. So um, let, let me say that um, it is increasingly common for a nominee to be nominated multiple years. And we have examples of um, current scholars and scholar alumni who were the nominees from their school on more than one occasion. And also, you know, we're not selected the first time or the second time, but ultimately we're selected the third time or we're not selected the first time and we're ultimately selected the second time. So um, it's not unlike applying for, you know, a grant when you um, have to be willing to revise and resubmit, revise and resubmit. And I think the, the real key here, well, there are, are multiple keys, but one, is this a career development award based on the priorities of the Macy Foundation that fit with your career? And do you have the support of your institution so that um, you know, they will stand behind you as, as the institutional nominee? So yes, be willing to revise and resubmit essentially um, in the same way that you would for a grant funding or for other awards or for other things that you do in your life. Um, you um, should not feel like this is a one and done kind of um, application process for, for all the reasons that I mentioned. Now, with respect um, to the question about do we provide feedback? So again, going back um, to my experience as a Dean for Medical Education, when year after year, my nominees were not selected, you know, you can't help but wonder, um, what is it that we're missing in the application um, process? What are we not um, uh, including or highlighting that um, ultimately results in, in being selected for this program? And so I came to the Macy Foundation with a strong interest in providing feedback because that's what I had longed for all along. But that was a specific question that we asked that external review committee that I mentioned during the course of my prepared um, uh, slide set. And um, the external review committee and our board of directors had a chance to discuss that question in detail. And ultimately we, we all decided that as much as we would love to do that, we are simply not in a position to be able to provide um, feedback in, an, in a 
consistent um, and comprehensive way um, for you. So while, while I regret that we can't do that, um, I want you to know it was very actively discussed and considered. And um, I, I would encourage you to um, stay very close to your own internal source of motivation, your very um, ideas and the people around you who um, support your ideas. And the more that you can stay focused on your project and your career development, ultimately one of the um, one of the awards that you apply for is going to come through for you. And um, staying true to your mission, staying true to the work that you're doing, ultimately you will you will be successful. So that's a very long answer uh, to a question that I hope you um, feel the passion that I, I personally resonate with. Holly. Um... Uh, a question that are flowing from your, your notion of learners that you spoke to earlier on, um, and it has to do with the learners in a proposed project. Um, we're getting a number of questions about sort of the diversity of learners, some about whether faculty development could be considered learners and be part of a faculty development project, or whether community nurses um, that are working outside the institutional setting, like in a school, school health nurse, for example, would they all be considered learners um, in your mind? And would they be part of a, a project that could be proposed under the scholars application? I would say that in general, we will have a narrower definition of learners. Um, and what I mean by that is, while faculty development could be a very appropriate project, that development should be able to show a direct relationship to undergraduate medical students or nursing students or residents or fellows or graduate students and it should not be faculty development in the continuing education sense. So in general, we would not be um, looking to support projects that are continuing education for already um, you know, fully licensed and certified physicians or nurses. If on the other hand, the nurses in the community setting are participating in faculty development so that those nurses in the community setting could be um, teaching and assessing students or graduate students, then that would be um, a very appropriate faculty development program. But if the faculty development program stops with faculty and doesn't go deeper into the pipeline of um, learners, then it would not be um, of the same, it would not have the same degree of enthusiastic support from our selection committee. Uh, we have time for one more questions and I apologize, there are a number of questions that are still in the Q and A and I'll, I'll speak to that in my closing remarks. But Holly, can you, um, can you tell us in general, how many applications does the foundation receive each time it launches a application for a new cohort of scholars? Yeah, that is um, a question that we asked ourselves when we began that review process that I spoke of. And in general, over the years, we have between 70 and 80, um, sometimes a little bit more than 80, but in that general range, um, year after year. So that's the, the total applicant pool that we have historically received. Thank you. Um, so we'll now um, conclude the Q&A portion of the webinar and just move on to some wrap up comments um, that I'll make and then hand it over to Holly for some closing remarks. Um, so we are utilizing an online application for the Macy Faculty Scholars Program. And to access this online application, you can go to our website and click on the Macy Faculty Scholars navigation bar, which is located at the top of the page. And that'll take you to the apply page to the program. And for your convenience, as you can see in the screen, there's a URL displayed. Um, 
And from there, once you get to the application, you just start it by hitting the button and you'll be taken directly into the online portal. To apply, you'll need to register for an account on the online portal. And you'll also need to get the tax ID for your school as part of the registration process. Once you've registered and logged in, you can save and return to your application as often as you like prior to submitting it. Now, we weren't able to get to all the questions today. Um, if you have questions throughout the application process, you can email them to us at info at macyfoundation.org, and we will reply to your question promptly. However, before you email us, we would encourage you to review the frequently asked questions that are posted on our website at the URL that's on this slide. We'll continue to update the frequently asked questions throughout the open application period. The program brochure, which is another very helpful and detailed resource is also available on our website. And finally, once again, this session has been recorded. Both the audio portion and the slides will be available on our website within the week. Holly, I'll turn it back to you for concluding remarks. Thank you, Peter. And I wanna just say a big thank you to all of you for participating today. I hope that uh, we will see applications from many of you over the course of the next few months. And most of all, I just want you to know um, that there are many ways that you can engage with the Macy Foundation as a potential grantee or as a participant in one of our webinars or our um, podcasts. And so I hope that you will stay connected to us. And most importantly, I just wanna say a thank you to you um, for the work that you're doing with patients and, and learners at your own institutions, especially in these very, very difficult days of um, multiple major social um, issues that are impacting our patients and our communities. So thank you very much.